All right, looks like the numbers are stabilizing, so we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to today's CNCF webinar, Rapidly Shipping Rust with Kubernetes and Scaffold. I'm Caitlin Barnard, Marketing Manager at CNCF, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. So just a few quick housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you're not able to speak as an attendee, so there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please drop them in there, and then we'll get to as many of those as we can at the end. And just as a reminder, the session is being recorded and will be sent out afterward along with the link to the presentation within about 24 hours, if not sooner. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to you to introduce today's presenters. Thank you so much, Caitlin, for the kind introduction and also to CNCF for hosting this webinar. Uh, before we get started, actually just a brief note on the title. It might seem that we were just trying to pick as many buzzwords and try to fit as many buzzwords into the title as possible, but there's actually a story behind that. And that actually, Shane will probably also tell us a little bit more about it, but it was basically that Shane was playing around with Rust and uh, he needed some more tools. He actually ended up using Kubernetes and Scaffold. And I, in particular, find that very interesting because Kubernetes and Scaffold are those cloud native technologies, whereas typically we don't think of Rust as like a cloud, typically cloud native tool. And uh, so I find it very interesting to see how Kubernetes and Scaffold can actually also help those non-cloud native tools to become more efficient. And this is why I'm pretty excited about this webinar. Um, can you just please go to the next slide? Yes, sir. Thanks. Who is excited about this? This is me, Jörg. I'm a technical lead uh, and engineer, mostly for data science over at Mesosphere. Uh, I'm also with our founder, Ben Heinzman. I'm also on the CMCF uh, governing board. And uh, I used to be a core developer over at Mesos. And so I basically have dealt with cloud native systems for at least the past five years of my life. And having that said, uh, I'd like to hand over to Gaston. Um, hello. I'm Gaston. It's a French name, but uh, I'm actually from Argentina. Um, I also work at Mesosphere. Uh, I'm a software engineer. I've been working on Mesos. Uh, so I'm a, an Apache Mesos committer, and I've been working on Mesos and uh, related things in the ecosystem for about three years now. Before that, I was working at AWS. I was working on Opsworks, which is kind of like a, I like to call it like chef, uh, orchestrated chef uh, on the cloud. So it's in the same space. And a few years be before that, I got the chance to uh, work on EDLs at Google using work. So that's how I first got into all this stuff. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to present about this. It's my first webinar, so have some patience. <laughs> um, and yeah, that, that's all about me. Let's now talk about Shane, who's the one who prepared the demonstration that will, you will be watching at the end of the talk. Hi, I'm Shane Ut. Um, I'm a software engineer here at Mesosphere. I'm going to be working on uh, CACD pipelines, mostly working with Kubernetes on DCOS. In previous lives, I worked on uh, Reoc at Basho and Infrastructure as a Service and Software as a Service at Liquid Web in the web hosting industry. Okay, so having done all the introductions, uh, we're ready to get started. I would like first to give like an outline of what this webinar will look like. Uh, at first, I, I will try to give like a, an introduction uh, on more development techniques and say why we think that all these passwords in the title are relevant and how they build the story. Then point out some of the challenges that uh, people starting using these technologies and following these uh, processes might face. Uh, then we, we will introduce some tools that can help uh, with those challenges. And finally, we will use them all together and uh, we will present a flow that can be followed by developers and there's a pre-recorded demo that we will play by Shane but he is here available so if you have any questions for him you can of course make them at any point. Um, so having said that uh, let's start with the first part of, of this presentation. Uh, basically I, I'm going to speak about some of the new things that are happening or not so new uh, in, in the space. So in this slide, you can see the EWASO Falls, the uh, Waterforce in, in Argentina. Um, so 
quite some people might be used to, or at least used to do development uh, or work on projects using the waterfall model, uh, in which you split your project into different stages, and then you first design your project, then you develop it, and then you test it. Uh, you only do those things once, and after the previous stage has finished. Um, I, I like to say that uh, a more modern approach, but it's like not that new anymore. It's like 10 years old, is to do your development uh, in a continuous or iterative way. So basically, you still design, develop, and test your, your stuff. And normally, there's not much overlap between that, but uh, you do that in, in, in cycles. So you design a bit of your project, you develop that, you test it, see that it works fine, that you could deliver that, and you're more confident, and then you can do another iteration. Uh, and yeah, depending on your project, you can have like tens of iterations or more. So since you're going to iterate a lot, it's really important uh, that each iteration is cheap and quick. You cannot spend days doing a deployment or trying your stuff. Otherwise, uh, you will really slow down. So in order to help doing that, to uh, be able to ship quickly, uh, you can use some CI, CD systems, like uh, some continuous integration and continuous development systems. And these systems basically help you automate that process of building your software and deploying that. Uh, and since you're, this is like a CNCF webinar, uh, we're going to be talking about containers and how they help make it easier to uh, deploy your applications. And yeah, how you can use the same stuff while you are developing your uh, your application and then ship that on, on production and have your CI CD tools uh, build all of that. So basically, using a CI CD tool uh, helps you achieve quick iterations that are necessary uh, if you're following a more agile model. Another thing that has changed uh, is well, I mean, it, it's a something that has changed. Like when you're working on an application, you might go through these stages. Uh, at first, you might start on a small project uh, with what is kind of, kind of like called pets. So you, you have uh, a few servers that you know very well, and you have given them cute names. And you install all your stuff there manually, and you SSH there, and you really care about them. If something goes wrong, you kind of like bring it to the veterinary. You, try to fix it and heal it, uh, and it can cause you downtime. Um, and next, so th th that could be fine if you have few users or uh, if you're just getting started, but once you go to production or if you are going to scale up your service, then you might want to treat those servers as, so have more servers, and you can treat them as pets anymore. You, you might want to uh, give them boring names like uh, web server once, web server two, or something like that. and uh, create them as cattle, uh, where you have some tooling, like could be some configuration management tooling, or you could use Pagar to create images or something like that. And then it's really easy to bring up a new server, uh, just like the other ones that you have already. And if one of them is sick and or yeah has some problem and goes down, you can just simply replace it easily. That works better when you yeah have more users or you need quicker iterations. Uh, and the next step is kind of like an abstraction on top of that. Uh, you can see all your servers as just one cluster. In this picture, you see just like one ship, uh, on top of which you can just deploy your applications. You pack them, your application in, in, a, in a container, and then you have some system. It could be Kubernetes, it could be Nomad or Mesos, uh, that will take those containers and deploy them somewhere in your cluster. Uh, one thing that should be, you should have in mind is that even though you can think of, of your cluster as just one thing as a, as a ship or something like that, there are still servers uh, underneath that. So someone will still have to take care of all the, all the servers, but that's something, it's, it's a topic for another talk. Uh, okay, so if you use CI CD tools and then you use something like Kubernetes and that stuff, and then then you can iterate much faster. Uh, but there are still some challenges that you will face, uh, some things that are still not super easy. Uh, if you're going to use containers, 
you have to build them each time that you commit new code or that you write new code. You have to take care of pushing them to either a remote Docker registry or locally somewhere. Um, and then you have to do a deployment. Uh, you might want to do a quick deployment to in your development environment uh, that could cause uh, downtime, but you are not worried about that because you're just testing it yourself. Uh, but once you go to production, you will want to uh, have like, I don't know, uh, canaries or blue green deployments, uh, stage deployments and stuff like that. So you need some tooling or automation or some process to handle that. Uh, also, a common pitfall of uh, moving applications to containers is that you just basically wrap everything in a, all your application and all the dependencies and everything in a single giant container and based on a large distribution like Ubuntu or something like that. Uh, and then you might end up with a giant, so you, you might move from having a giant binary to having a giant container that's like a three or four gigs uh, large. And that has some problems, like building that takes some time and you need a powerful machine. Well, not super powerful, but you need a decent machine. Uh, each time you build something, uh, well, the, the builds get slow because you, you have to fetch all the layers and then run all the steps. And even though you can cache some things, it, it, it adds some latency to your development process. Uh, that latency is also present when you're deploying your service. Uh, you will push it to Kubernetes or, or something like that. And then each kubelet, each node will have to pull your image that can be very large. Uh, so it will take a time for your service to be live and ready. Um, and another challenge, this is not so much inherent uh, to using containers or orchestration tools or something like that. It's more something that uh, luckily developers have been focusing more, more on lately and is safety. Uh, basically uh, making sure that if you're using concurrency and threads that you're using those things in a safe way. And memory safety is also pretty important. Uh, at least I'm a, I spend most of my time working on Mesos and C++ uh, where it's really easy to shoot yourself on your foot and have, uh, I don't know, your application crash or some security problems. Uh, but we will introduce uh, in the next slide actually uh, Rust, which can help you with that. Uh, so this is how Rust, so from, so the, up to the previous slide I was introducing uh, some, some techniques and stuff like that. Now we're going to talk about some tools that you can use to actually create a flow for your developers to use uh, and to be able to iterate quickly and deploy things rapidly to production. Um, the first tool is Rust. It's a programming language created at Mozilla. Um, it was designed to be safe, concurrent, and practical. So that means that uh, safety is built in into the language. It's not an afterthought. Uh, the compiler and many of the, yeah, the compiler will check many things for you while you're writing code. Uh, so it's really hard to write unsafe code in, in Rust. You basically have to wrap your unsafe code in the unsafe keyword. Um, something I forgot to say is that uh, this is a low level uh, and static language. So you get a binary when you compile your, your application uh, that performs really well there. You, you don't need a virtual machine or interpreter or anything like that to run it. And the performance is similar to idiomatic C++ if you're write, writing idiomatic uh, Rust. And yeah, it has a strong emphasis on safety uh, and control of the memory layout so that you know that no one, no, no other thread is going to overwrite what you're uh, writing. You, you know who owns each structure that you create. Uh, and last but not least, there's a great uh, and very friendly community behind it. That's pretty refreshing if you're coming from another language. Uh, so yeah, I encourage you to play with it if, if, if you can. Um, oh, talking about performance again, like you could compare this to Go. Uh, one of the things is that Rust doesn't have a, garbage collection, so in some cases it might perform better. Yeah. There are, of course, uh, some challenges with, with Rust. No, nothing is uh, perfect. There's no silver bullet. And uh, one of the things is that it's a relatively young language. It's a few years old, but it's still new compared to 
you know, C++ or C or Java or something like that. Um, as I said, it brings some extra safety and the compiler is really strict and doesn't let you mess up or tries really hard to prevent you from messing up. Uh, but for it to do that, you have to pay some upfront price. Like, uh, you have to understand some new concepts like uh, what a borrow is. Uh, you have to really get familiar with the language before playing with that. Uh, and because it's a new or well, pretty young language, many engineers are still pretty new to it. Uh, and integrating it into, into a stack might be not smooth because they don't have experience with that. And then they also will start experimenting that and getting errors and stuff like that. So they will need to iterate very quickly to be able to get up to speed. Uh, one of the errors that I, I mentioned uh, or things that could happen could be, for instance, trying to write a hello world uh, program and then getting an error from the compiler saying, hey, uh, print line doesn't exist. Do you mean like print line exclamation mark? That's a macro. Uh, because in Rust, uh, print line is actually a macro. It's not a function. Uh, and yeah, I, I find that the Rust uh, compiler is really helpful and gives you a lot of really useful messages. But you have to uh, be able to quickly run it and see where your code is fine or not, where it satisfies the compiler or not, and then be able to iterate on that. Another kind of message that you can get is like, uh, trying to modify uh, an immutable variable. In Rust, variables are immutable by, by default. And that's also not that common in our languages. And that can catch you by surprise. And again, the compiler is really friendly and helpful, and it will let you know about that. But you need to run it often in order to find your problems. If you have already written a lot of code, then you will, have a, you will spend a few hours uh, uh, just fighting your compiler. and fixing each error only to find a new one. Um, so yeah, that, that was pretty much uh, why we chose Rust. Uh, we think, as York said, that it's not one of the most common cloud native languages used, but it's really valuable in this time, uh, these days. And it benefits, like if you can iterate quickly, then your experience using it gets much nicer. Uh, and we will move on to Kubernetes. And like, uh, I think that's one of the reasons why you're here. You want to talk, uh, like listen about how you can develop Rust on Kubernetes quickly. Uh, but I, I still thought I would, like a, I would like to give a short introduction on what it does. So Kubernetes lets you see all your servers uh, that used to be pets or cattle as just one cluster. And then using different tools, or uh, you can, well, you can just use kubectl, or you can use some tools like scaffold, and then uh, deploy your or your system using containers on, on that cluster. And Kubernetes will take care of orchestrating those containers and choosing where they land, making sure that if one of them goes away because of some problem, it is replaced. And yeah, basically makes your life much easier. Uh, and you can use Kubernetes uh, remotely when you're deploying on production, but you can also use it locally. You can use something like Minikube uh, or a smaller development cluster and then use that while you're developing your application. One of the nice things that it enables you is to use immutable infrastructure. So basically, you can build a container once and you just deploy that. Uh, if you need to scale up, scale down, you can just deploy more instances of your container. Uh, you don't have to create new machines and then run any chef recipes or any Ansible playbooks or anything like that. You can just add a new and like scale up your containers, your service. Um, and in order to let you scale things up and down uh, and do deployments and stuff like that, it provides some useful abstractions and tools, uh, some of which we will use uh, in the demo. Uh, but still, like if you're, Deploying an application here uh, using Kubernetes, you, you have to take care of building your application, of pushing it somewhere, uh, of doing a, a deployment. Uh, and you could automate that. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a lot of manual work otherwise. And luckily, there are some tools that help you automate all that process. Uh, one of them is Scaffold by, by Google. It's basically a CLI tool. Uh, 
that facilitates or make it easy to do continuous development uh, using Kubernetes. What it does is it, it handles the workflow from building your application. So you still have to code it, of course. Uh, we are not replaced yet as uh, engineers. Uh, but once you have saved or committed your changes, then Scaffold can take over and build a new image for you, push it somewhere to a registry, could be IRB locally or remotely, and deploy it for you. Uh, and yeah, again, you can use it to iterate on your applications uh, while working locally. So you can just, uh, as you will see in a demo, you can change a line in, in, in a, line, like a line of code in your source and just save it and then scaffold will be watching your code and notice that you changed something and it will do all the run all the workflow like build push and deploy uh, push and deploy and you will see your changes almost instantly or you can use the same tool uh, to deploy on production basically and push your changes to a remote cluster um, so as i was saying uh, scaffold basically takes care of these three steps, build, push, and deploy. Uh, it's very configurable. So if you are doing some local development, you can make it uh, use your local Docker daemon. So to run a Docker build, when you are building your software, uh, the push stage would be skipped because you already use your local Docker daemon. So there's nowhere to push it there. And then you will deploy it using kubectl uh, to your mini cube cluster that you're running locally. So that, that's basically how you can get started using Scaffold. Um, once you're more confident or when you want to ship your stuff uh, to production, then you can change your Scaffold configuration and make it use something like Google Container Build uh, Builder for, for the build stage. Then once you have the output from Google Container Builder, you can push it to Google Container Registry, or it could be just a remote Docker registry on DCOS or any other registry. And then finally, you can deploy it on GKE or, uh, yeah, or on any, any remote Kubernetes cluster. And it not only supports kubectl, but it also supports other tools like Helm. Uh, so it's pretty flexible. Um, and Basically, there are two different modes in which you can run this. We will, I will, I will talk about that in the next slide. Uh, but the way in which you can get started using Scaffold is to first create your Kubernetes manifest. You will need that anyway if you're using Kubernetes, so that's not an extra overhead that you, like it's not something extra you, you have to do for Scaffold. Uh, but that, it, it's really important because it needs to know how to deploy your application. Once you have that written, uh, then you have to create a new file. It's the scaffold.yaml file. And there you tell scaffold how to perform each of those uh, build, push, and deployment stages. Uh, there you tell it which tools it should use, whether it should do it locally or remotely, and that stuff. And then when, while you are developing locally on your machine, you can run scaffold dev. Uh, and what scaffold will do, it, it will run in the background. Well, actually, it will be in the, on the foreground in your console, console, but you can forget about it for a while, and then you can work on your application. And each time you save something, each time you change a file, uh, Scaffold will notice that because it will be watching uh, a repository or a directory, and then it will run that pipeline, that uh, build, push, deploy pipeline, and it will let you. Well, if there if there are any errors uh, while building your applications, you will notice right away. Uh, Otherwise, uh, it will perform all of those steps successfully, and then you will be able to see your changes uh, live in seconds. Uh, the last step that you want to do on a project uh, is integrate scaffold into your CI CD tooling, into Jenkins uh, or something like that. Uh, so, scaffold also has this run mode or run command that will run the whole pipeline only once. So Scaffold will not watch for any changes or, or anything like that. It will try those steps, uh, exit if it's successful, uh, uh, but also if there are any, any problems, if there's uh, an error, then it will print that, log that, and exit as well uh, with a failure. Uh, 
So what it lets you do is you, you can set up Jenkins to watch for any new commits or anything like that on your repository. And then when you have something, uh, so you, you can set it to trigger scaffold and to just do a single run. Uh, and that way you can use the same tool that you use to de develop locally uh, to deploy things to production. Um, one of the advantages of, of scaffold uh, and Kubernetes and all, all the stack that we're describing is that it makes it really easy for someone to set up a development environment. At least in the past, uh, in some projects I, I worked at, I had to spend like a day or a few days setting up all the dependencies and all the environment. Uh, if you use Scaffold and Kubernetes and Docker, then it's really quick. You just pull a new repository, maybe install Minikube. That's pretty easy and automated and, and Docker and then you can just run scaffold and change uh, your project on, uh, and then you can see your changes deployed live in, in a matter of minutes or something like that. Um, so this is basically a, to give like a, a flow of what our demo looks like and what the workflow for a developer is. Uh, at the left, you have a happy developer who is writing a lot of Rust, maybe getting started with Rust uh, and then uh, on local mode, he will save a, a file uh, and Scaffold will be watching th those files and then uh, that update will trigger and as Scaffold run. And what Scaffold will do is it, it will build the Docker image, uh, it will skip the push uh, stage locally, and then it will deploy it to a Kubernetes cluster where you can see your changes live. If you're running this on CI, then your happy developer, instead of saving a file, will First, save it, try it locally, and push it to CI. And then Jenkins uh, will be triggered, and that will call Scaffold, and the rest is the same. Like scaffold will do a build. In this case, it will really push something and deploy it. Um, yeah, that was basically uh, my introduction to, to this. And now we will move to the demo. Uh, we didn't want to leave it up to the live demo goats, so we have it pre recorded. Uh, but Jane is here and I can post it at any, any moment as well. So uh, yeah, I'll move to that. Uh, now you will see some flicker on the screen. I have to switch uh, what I'm sharing. So please bear with me for a minute. And when I do that, uh, you can see a GitHub uh, link on the bottom. So this is all in a public uh, GitHub repository. Uh, feel free to visit that and play with all this stuff. Okay, so I will start the video now. Uh, let me know if the audio doesn't work or something like that. I tried this before and it should work, but you never know. Then we'll start Oops. the base. This is a demonstration of deploying Rust to Kubernetes on DCOS with Scaffold. In this demonstration, we're going to build a small Rust web app with Rocket.rs and Diesel, which we're going to have automatically deployed and redeployed on changes for us with Scaffold. There are several steps in this demo. First, we'll set up Kubernetes Ingress. Then, we'll start the base Rust application. Then, we'll do our first deployment and redeployment with Scaffold. Then, we'll add the database and the REST API, which make up the app, and watch all of our changes shipped out to Kubernetes automatically by Scaffold in the background. After that, we'll do cleanup and conclusions. For this demonstration, you need a DCOS 1.11 plus cluster with Kubernetes on DCOS 130.1.10.8 or greater, Docker, kubectl, and Scaffold. For the purposes of this demonstration, we're going to gloss over installation of DCOS or Kubernetes on DCOS, as those are covered in our documentation, which is linked here. If you're not familiar with DCOS, it has the idea of public versus private agents, and Kubernetes on DCOS deploys its nodes either to a public or private agent. So for this demo, I used a small Kubernetes cluster with three public nodes and three private nodes. If you want to run the demo, make sure you at least have one public and one private Kubernetes node in your Kubernetes on DCOS cluster. Next, we'll be setting up Kubernetes ingress. For this demo, we'll be using Nginx for ingress. All we need to do is run this line. 
which will grow and grab our manifests for Nginx Ingress. Um, the important one to focus on is the daemon set for the Nginx Ingress controller. At the bottom here, there's a specifically Kubernetes on DCOS uh, node selector entry. Um, we are only going to be deploying to our public nodes. So now we can see that I have the uh, Nginx controller running on all of my three public nodes. From here, you're going to want to make sure you export the variable public node IP. I've already done that in the background. Basically, that needs to be exported to the public IP address of one of your DCOS public agents. How you get that is dependent on your environment. Next, we're going to set up our base Rust app and do a small build to test it. First, we'll need the cargo.toml file, which is the configuration for our dependencies. We'll be using diesel which is an ORM for Rust, so that we can talk to Postgres later. Rocket is our web framework, and there's some other things in here for handling JSON and so forth. We're going to drop that file in our demo directory as cargo.toml. Next, we're going to create our main.rs file. All this is doing for now is printing out Rocket web server. We'll be making changes to this and having Scaffold deploy those changes automatically in the background. But for now, that's just for our initial test. Next, we'll add our Docker file. There's a couple of important notes that are down here about the Docker file. For one, uh, we pull a very specific version of Rust nightly. Nightly is required for Rocket.rs, and this is the last version I tested with this demo. Um, we are also going to be doing some tricks in here. This is noted here. Cargo, the build tool for Rust, does not have a dependencies only build option. So to help with Docker caching, we do some tricky stuff here. And then ultimately we're using a multi-stage Docker build um, so that we're ult uh, ultimately emitting a image based on Alpine latest um, so that it comes out to less than 20 megs, very small image. So we'll create that. And we'll also create a docker ignore file. I've done this in the background, but from here, if you're walking through the demo, you'll want to make sure that you log, in, log into Docker Hub. Okay, moving forward. We're going to do our first test. We'll do a docker build. In the background, I already did the build just because the first one takes a while. And then run the app locally in Docker for testing. So it should be up and running as a Rust web demo. And then you should be able to reach it here. Rocket web server. Now we can move on to starting to deploy continuously with Scaffold. Um, we're, we're eventually going to be adding a Postgres container here. And we're also going to be making changes to our app. And Scaffold dev mode will run in the background and push those changes up for us. It's going to need manifests for that. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a scaffold deployment.yaml, which is going to include the ingress, service, and deployment for our Rust web demo. At this point, you'll want to export the variable demo domain. I've done that in the background. You can pretty much choose anything. We're going to use the host header with curl to actually make the tests um, against the uh, the cluster. Make sure that you have Scaffold installed and that you're running the latest release. And then this is our Scaffold configuration itself, which is just going to say these are where our manifests are in the Scaffold deployment file we just made. We'll need to edit both of these files. And make sure you change your username to your actual username on Docker Hub. So mine's Shaynut. Do the same on the manifests. And also replace demo domain with the demo domain that you're going to use. So I'm going to use um, a non-existent subdomain. Next, we'll do our first deployment with Scaffold. We're going to run Scaffold Dev to continuously deploy changes out to our Kubernetes cluster. You can add the dash V debug flag if you'd like for additional verbose output. 
uh, to either just let you know more of what Scaffold's doing or if you're having problems, that can be helpful. So we're going to go ahead and run that. We're going to go ahead and run that over here. And it's going to go ahead and deploy our Rust web demo. And then momentarily, there we go, should be able to curl it and see Rocket Web Server. Next, we'll do our first demonstration of Scaffold uh, automatically redeploying. So this is the same main RS file, more or less, except for this line. We've changed it from saying Rocket Web Server to saying Scaffold updated me. We're going to just override the whole file. Scaffold will do its business in the background. And we should just be able to start curling and eventually get the updated version of the app. There it is. We have three replicas. It takes a minute for them all. Okay. Next, we're going to deploy a Postgres database. This is not an HA one. This is just a demo Postgres database. Um, we're going to have Scaffold deploy it for us and manage it for us. We'll add this. Uh, these manifest the service and the deployment for Postgres to our Scaffold deployment. And the scaffold will go ahead in the background and set up the Postgres server for us. And next, we'll set up Diesel. So Diesel is an ORM for Rust, uh, which we're going to use to talk to Postgres. Um, one of the things you'll want to do in the background is set up this port forward. We're going to use um, the local Diesel CLI to deploy our migrations to the Postgres server. Uh, if you want to take this demo further, something like Kubernetes init containers would be a better way to do that, but just for demonstration purposes, we're just going to do it this way because it's simple. So I have that running in the background. So I should be able to go ahead and talk to my database. There it is. Next, we're going to install the diesel CLI, which is used for managing migrations. I already have it installed, but that's all you need to run is just cargo install diesel CLI and then say we want the Postgres feature. Then we're going to create a .env file, um, which is going to contain the uh, uh, connection information for Postgres. We'll run diesel setup, which will create our migrations directory. Get that templated out for us. And then we're going to override the initial up and down migration. So we're going to create a table called employees. Employees are going to have a first name, a last name, an age, and a title. And then our down is our rollback. So we're going to drop uh, the employees table in the sequence. Once that's done, we can do our initial run of the migrations. And then We'll do a redo as well, which will do the rollback and then rerun the initial migration just to make sure that everything's working. If everything worked properly, you should be able to run this, look at the tables, and see that the employees table is there. From here, we're going to add diesel code to uh, manage Postgres connections and talking to the database for us. So we'll add the postgres.rs file. This is just going to uh, have a function that produces a PG connection for us. We're going to add models.rs, which will include our employee model. And then we're going to print the schema using the diesel CLI. There we go. Again, uh, you may want to do this a different way if you take this demo further, but for now, we're just going to manually add uh, a default employee. Update the sequence. And then we should be able to see that we've added our default employee. Some person. This is a software engineer, age 25. the Rust web demo to get the database URL, the connection information for Postgres, we're going to add a secret. So 
that is the Rust Web Demo Database URL secret. That's just getting tagged onto the end of our scaffold deployment. And then scaffold will go ahead and uh, create that secret for us. Now we need to add um, an environment entry so that the app has access to the database URL. So we'll just edit the scaffold deployment itself and tag that on here. Ugh. Okay, scaffold will send that up for us and uh, reconfigured, oops, well it went up there, but it reconfigured the app for us. Now we're going to do, we're going to update our main.rs and instead of just printing out scaffold updated me or rocket web server, we're going to have it actually show us the default employee and pull it from the database. So that's what this new main.rs does. Um, ultimately if you get, you'll get the default employee and then the results uh, using diesel from the database. And then once everything's working, you should start getting the updated version here shortly. Oh. Now it should come in. There it is. And then all three of our replicas are done. Okay. Okay, next we're going to set up the REST API um, so that we can get put, post, and delete the employee data. Um, one thing you can do here, uh, and you can actually do above too, pretty much any time if you want. Sometimes I get in the habit of just Control Z stopping scaffold in the background uh, when I'm running scaffold dev, uh, just because if I'm changing a lot of files, I may not want it to constantly ship out. So we're going to override our models.rs. We're going to expand upon the employee model. We're going to derive uh, a bunch of different traits for it. So serialize and deserialize for JSON, queryable and insertable for diesel. And then we're going to create an employee list which is serializable um, so that we can just produce a list of all the employees in the system. We're going to add some just very basic we have errors. Uh, if you take this demo further you'll obviously want to expand upon the errors. Then we'll create a form uh, for employees so that we can um, uh, accept employee models via JSON. And then finally the meat and potatoes of the demo. Um, we're going to add all of our git, put, post, and delete methods. So this API.rs will have a 404 catcher and then git employees which will produce uh, employee list. Um, get employees with a specific employee ID, which will give you the information about that employee. Put employee for adding a new employee to the system. Post to update existing employees. And delete to remove an employee from the system. So next we're going to override our main.rs and bring it all together. Um, we're going to uh, deploy Rocket with the routes that we built above and start testing the app. Okay, and we can bring Scaffold back and let it do its job. Now everything should be working. We should be able to get our default employee via the API. There's some person, age 25, software engineer. Get a list of our employees. Just that one for now. We'll add a new employee. This will be new person, age 27, DevOps engineer. And if we go in list, we'll see that they're now added. We'll update the new employee. So let's say there was a clerical error 
and we are going to update their age from 27 to 29. Their ID is 2. And then we'll take a look at the employees again, and we can see both of them are in there. The changes, they're no longer age 27, they're age 29. And then ultimately, delete. We can delete our new one and the original one. And then if we list, nothing in there. That's pretty much it for this demo. Uh, at the end here, if you want to clean up, you can press Control C once and Scaffold will take care of cleaning everything up that it deployed for you. And then to clean up the rest of the resources we added, um, just do a delete on the ingressnginx.yaml that we originally created from. And that's pretty much it. Um, so there's some notes here in the conclusions about where you can take this demo next if you'd like. Uh, things like using uh, an HA Postgres setup, um, using diesel connection pooling and rocket managed state. Um, all links here and links to Scaffold and uh, Mesosphere uh, Kubernetes and DCOS and the DCOS documentation. Thank you. Okay, so that was basically the demo. Uh, at the end, uh, I mentioned some things that you could do if you want to take this demo further. Uh, just to repeat that, uh, we really don't recommend running Postgres uh, like there. You, if you run anything on production, you might want to make sure that you run an HA highly available Postgres setup uh, with stateful uh, volumes. So that if you do an hour deployment, you don't lose your data. And, and yeah, so you can back up, do backups and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, there are some features from the Rust libraries that uh, he didn't use for this demo. Uh, that you might want to experiment with them, with connection pools and using managed state and rocket and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. We also wanted to let you know that uh, we will be presenting uh, on this topic uh, at QCon China. So we will have add more content and make it uh, interesting. Uh, basically, we will do iterative development on, on this demo as well, uh, on this presentation. And yeah, we will be presenting in China on November the 14th, I think, yeah, something like that. So I look forward to seeing you there, meeting you there. And now it's time for questions. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you guys so much for presenting, especially the demo. I, I was really excited. And if I hadn't actually run through it this morning, I would probably, that would be the next thing I would do right after. Um, in terms of question, we don't have too much time left. So I would actually just ask one question. And that would be, what would be kind of alternative stacks you can come up with? This is now like one particular choice of technology, but what other uh, options uh, could you see? Um, so I think you can use Scaffold uh, for any R language. Uh, someone was saying that he was interested in using it for Node.js and Go. Uh, basically, at the build step, you can make it run, uh, build any Docker image. Uh, so. If you change your Docker file, you could be building a Go application or another application, and it even supports space as well. So you, you can switch the language to whatever you prefer, uh, and everything else will work the same. Um, I, I would still yeah, use Scaffold, uh, because it's really nice. It watches your changes, and it will do all the steps for you. But you, you can switch also your class, or you can, uh, instead of using DCOS, you can uh, deploy that to GKE or on Amazon. Yeah, I was going to say something similar. So like the, the demo, I wrote it originally because I had a Kubernetes on DCOS cluster available. Um, this demo works just as easily on uh, Minikube. And in fact, Scaffold will automatically do um, port forwards for you. So you don't even have to use Ingress or anything like that. Um, but pretty much, um, you know, take out any piece you want. Scaffold doesn't even have to be part of an actual, uh, like a full on CDI, CI CD pipeline. You can just use it for development on Minikube or something like that. And that's a good use of it as well. So, so you would even do your local development uh, the same style as just a Minikube cluster instead of like a large cluster somewhere else that you're deploying to? 
Yep. Cool. All right. Thank you so much again for presenting. Uh, feel free to follow up with questions afterwards. Uh, and also hope to see some of you at KeepCon China. With that, I'll hand back to Caitlin, uh, who's going to do the housekeeping uh, and finalizing. Awesome. Thanks so much for the great presentation today. And thank you, everyone, who joined us for today's webinar. Um, just a reminder, the webinar recording and slides will be online later today, um, and you'll receive an in a link directly to your email. Um, so looking forward to seeing you all at a future CNCF webinar. Have a great day, everyone.